Today, I'm joined with Jack Fleckney. Jack, I'm very grateful to have you on the podcast. Awesome, Mel. Thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk with you, mate. So Jack is a very remarkable, different kind of guy. The first time I ever saw him, he was climbing up the side of a mountain. And I'm literally saying that in a literal sense. So who is Jack Fleckney? <laughs> oh, what an introduction. Yeah, that was. That's where we first met at the top of the Peak District, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, who am I? I probably suppose I've probably been built on uh, taking on multiple different challenges. So if we rewind from taking on speech and learning difficulties through my primary years to then obviously lit, growing up really without, uh, without my real father in, in my life. And then moving in to try and play rugby uh, and then join the, join the Royal Marines and military. And then I'm going to business and these different uh, business world and the different fitness challenges that you've, you've obviously seen me doing recently. Impressive. So Jack does incredible amounts of dis- uncomfortable challenges and all in the hopes to get people to pay up. And then he sends all the money to charity. That's exactly it, mate. Yeah, that was the, that was the goal. The, the journey for me started of doing this probably around, I would probably say nine years ago, where with, I don't know if you've, have you seen one of those assault bikes before? You know, the bike you sit on and the arms go as well as the, mm. as the legs, yeah? And it's on a fan. Well, we, unfortunately, one of the gyms I was going to, one of the members passed away uh, with cancer. So they wanted to obviously naturally do a fundraiser for that. And they did like a, a workout every hour and you could book in a slot for out the for that 24 hours. And about two days before we noticed that no one had booked the middle of the night slot. So I said jokingly to my friends, Oh, I've got an assault bike home, I'll bring it in and I'll just sit on there for 24 hours. And they were like, No, nah, you won't, no, you won't. So obviously I just I just bought the bike, turned up, had no idea what I was doing. I literally bought some sweets, some croissants, and some milk. That was it. <laughs> And literally just put it on a box next to the bike and just got on there and started pedaling, mate. And then, you know, I saw the, 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 I don't, I never feel rewarded from what I've done physically. What I do feel rewarded about though, is the ability that it's maybe helped someone else. So the moment I did that and saw that we'd, you know, got a bit of awareness, raised some money, then, uh, then it was a, it was sort of like, it's just been a bit of a slow burner of me doing more challenges that probably got a little bit bigger and we've ended up fundraising a little bit more. That's awesome to hear. Let's talk about your time as a Royal Marine. It was a commando, wasn't it, that you were? Yes, that's it, yes, yeah. Yeah, I, um, I would start, I start, well, my rugby contract ended and I wasn't quite good enough to, to continue playing professionally the team I was at. And I was already interested in the military because I was reading the Andy McNabb books, you know, there you've probably seen them before. And uh, just fascinated really about, you know, the history of the military and, uh, and just the, the idea of it excited me and I became quite passionate about it. I wanted to join the army to begin with and I, and I went to careers office at the army careers office in London where I was living and got my, got the information on the paperwork and on the walk back. I walked past the Royal Navy careers office and the Royal Marines is part of the Royal Navy. And on the window there, there was a poster that said, uh, Royal Marines, 99.9% need not apply. And I was like, oh, that, sounds, that sounds like a little bit of me. And then I went away, obviously I went in there, walked straight in and, uh, and got again, got the leaflets, got the info, looked into it and just saw what the Royal Marines is all about, what their ethos is about. Um, the, the, the fact they've got the longest basic training in the world, the basic military training in the world, which is 32 weeks long, so about nine months. And, uh, and yeah, that was the process. Then I signed up and ended up, yeah, going through training when I think I was 17, 18, when I, when I arrived down at Limpston to go through training, uh, maybe after this podcast, I, you might've seen it online anyway, a funny picture of me looking extremely young, uh, <laughs> going through training, mate. Yeah. We'll see you in a, on your Instagram. Mm. Indeed. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. And then, and then re- realistically, mate, I was very busy. I, I passed out of training, enjoyed my unit. It was very, very lucky because it was a very active time when I was in. There was lots of things going on. We had lots of um, issues in Africa with things like uh, Gaddafi uh, and what we saw in North Africa and the issues there. And then we also saw lots of anti-piracy problems as well as then in the Middle East, things like uh, Afghanistan and Iraq was still sort of happening. So uh, for me, I, I, I think I joined, I, I joined my unit out of training. I think pretty much about a month later, I was on a boat um, heading out to the Middle East uh, for about six months. And I think in that six months, I think I visited 
uh, probably around 10 to 12 different countries working. For, so for an 18 year old, it was just incredible. Uh, so, so many experiences. I think that was one of my favorite trips I did. And then, uh, and then, yeah, from there, lots of different places, America doing training, uh, then off to Afghanistan to do your traditional uh, Herrick tour. Uh, and then, yeah, I suppose that was five year period that I did that. What does it take to become a Marine? To be honest with you, I think you've just got to you've just got to want it. I think you've got to really want it, and that's the key. And they'll and with the with what they do through tra training, they'll they'll weed out the people that aren't interested. So as an example, me and you could not do any training for a year and, and turn up to training relatively unfit, because if we wanted it, we would be able to hold on and keep improving during those thirty two weeks of training and get to the end. And that's what it's all about. They'll test you mentally and physically. The physical side obviously is an important factor. But actually, with the way they take you through training, they'll build you up. So, you you know, I think actually the, the main thing for me was I remember I, I went and did my pre-selection to start the Marine training. I remember seeing the guy at the front and he had his green beret on. And that's like the mark of being a Royal Marine. And I remember seeing that just thinking, that's that's what I want. That's it. And that's what I was like fascinated on having. So, uh, if to be honest with you, I think it's that. And I, and. I think the rest of the stuff, you know, the mindset and all those things, I think you develop that over time with being in those environments. What kind of mindset? Uh, well, there's quite a few. That, there's a few parts of the ethos of the Marines that is relatively important, I think. And um, so the first, the first one I think is very important is cheerfulness in the face of adversity. So that means, you know, in the ability when you really are in hardship, uh, in stressful situations, the ability to actually smile and have a laugh still. And I suppose for me, that's become something very, very important because it's a bit of a, it's a stress control. So you, you're only in your own bubble. So when you're in those stressful environments, you think that is the bit worst thing in the whole wide world. So be able to take a step back and make a joke of it sort of calms the whole situation down a lot. So that's probably one. I think determination is another one. So being able to, to continue to work and push hard when maybe the odds are against you or it feels like uh, maybe the goal is very, very far away. I like that. The determination or dedication versus enjoyment. I think you've mentioned that in one of your YouTube videos. Would you expand on that? Uh, what, what do you mean? Is in the, the, the difference between the two? More so the, the mindset that you pursue. Because you're, you're doing a lot of crazy things. And to a lot of people, it almost seems out of reach because the, the level of dedication and discipline required. But somehow, it, it kind of seems like it's fun and enjoyable for you. Well, that's because I've aligned my passion with, with what it is. That's why. So, so uh, and I actually did a talk last night to a business about exactly this thing. And I said, the first thing you've got to do before you start making these challenges, or and, and, and challenges, obviously, people his, from hearing me speak will think they're fitness. They can be lifestyle, work, you know, a lot of the things that you, you specialize in. Um, but a challenge can be anything. We're all in a challenge with lockdown at the minute. But in order to make these challenges and work to the end of them, you need to make sure it aligns with what your passion is because it will make sure that, for me, the passion is drive. So when you do have those hurdles, those hard times, because it's your passion, you enjoy mm. doing it. It's very important. And I'm very, I'm very black and white on that. If I try and take something on or I sign up to do something that I'm not, I'm not you know, feeling, I'm not that interested in, I will put no effort into preparing for it. And, I've, and that's happened to me in the past with things I've done. So uh, what I've learned now is I lie in things that excite me. So the idea of this next challenge that you've seen me doing, this chin-up challenge, excites me because the likelihood of failure is very high. The odds are against me. And that actually makes me excited and it, it, fuel, it fuels me to go, I can do this. Uh, and, I've, and, and there's other factors to it. For instance, that what I'm raising the money for this time is for, is for children and kids in my, my area in Northamptonshire that have, and Northamptonshire is quite a hub for kids being groomed into gangs between the age of about 10 and 18. Um, and also kids that have been kicked out of their mainstream education. So what happens is they just get lost and they don't have any re-education or any prep to go into the workplace. So for them, the odds are against them as well. So this is very much aligned with my task of going, these chin-ups, the odds are against me. I'm heavy. I've got long arms. You know, I couldn't do a lot of chin-ups when I started training for this. So that's, that's probably the pathway for me. But it's all about the passion. That's very admirable. 
you're putting yourself through discomfort and insane challenges. I think it's six thousand chin ups in twenty four hours. Yeah, that's that's the uh, that's the goal at the minute. So 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 you say it's admirable, but this is the, this is the thing. It doesn't feel like that for me. So, um, what does it feel I, like for you? Uh, it feels like I'm just doing what I do. If that makes sense, it doesn't. I, I you know I think. There is maybe that the emo- emotional connection to it is that I'm probably looking for that fulfillment from from the fundraising side of things, and and obviously the challenge. I think you know I've done some of these challenges in the past. I always walk away from, and I'll, I'll probably will. And something I'm trying to work on because I think everyone's always working on things themselves is is to try and feel fulfillment in being successful of completing that challenge. Whereas the only thing I feel in a minute is yeah, that was really nice to be able to do that and offer that to these kids. And maybe in a six months time, I'll go and visit the premises and I'll see, see what's happening, the actual groundwork to that and feel, okay, you know, that's, that was good. That was worth it. But for me personally, yeah, I don't, I don't ever see it as admirable and I probably don't feel fulfilled from the challenge. Hmm. How could a listener who's active right now, how could they contribute to this fundraiser? Uh, well, at the minute, actually, we haven't launched all the fundraising yet because of obviously all the situation we find ourselves in. So we can't uh, announce a date yet to do it. But hopefully we're, gonna, we're now looking at June because of all the recent announcements. So with it being in June, about four weeks before the event, all the fundraising will be released on uh, through the news outlets, through my own social media and YouTube and things. So if, if you know listeners are really interested in following my journey and what we're doing fundraising wise, I'll probably say the best place to go, although I'm still learning to be better on it, to jump onto Instagram and uh, maybe give me a follow because I'll keep pushing content in the lead up to there. Basically, as you've seen, every every video is just me doing chin ups at the minute. <laughs> <laughs> His Instagram is at Jack Fleckney, F L E C K N E Y. I'll be linking it in the description so you can go to it right now and follow him. Turn on the post note. They have that on Instagram, don't they? Post notifications. Yeah, exactly. I'm used to saying that as a YouTuber, like, go and smash that like button, guys. <laughs> thank, you, mate. thank you for letting everyone know sort of like, yeah, about my story and sharing it. Mm, you're welcome. So, Jack also has a gym, Shire Fit. And so I wanted to ask you a few questions about leadership. Mm. Do you feel that's a skill that can be trained? Yes, I do, actually, because I've definitely learned so much probably since maybe the age of about 15, 14, 15 in leadership and I've slowly layered on. I think you end up molding your leadership style into what you think is right. So I've definitely added things on. I think there needs to be, I think you need to be a certain personality type to be a leader though. Um, And I don't know if you disagree or agree, but I think there needs to be certain traits um, within your personality that make you a good leader. I'm not sure what they are, but I think you've got to, as a, as a leader, you've got to be someone that can inspire others. And you've also got to be very thoughtful of others. Mm. Um, so I, I think, I do think they're, they're kind of personality traits. So if you find, you know, you, you get, it's rare, but you find someone that's maybe extremely selfish, often they won't make the best leaders because they are, they're not concerned about the team effort, which I think leadership is very much about. Uh, they're only interested in their own selves. So although they might be successful within a team, I don't think they are often good leaders. Mm, well said. I agree to an extent. I think that the ability to take that responsibility onto yourself and then to try and disperse it amongst your subordinates in a fancy way of saying it is, for example, this book right here, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. So you said to be able to inspire others. That's a principle in this book is to talk in terms of the other person's interests. So when, for example, I I invited you to do this podcast, I didn't just say, oh, I've got a podcast. Would you like to be on it? I put it into your interest and I said, I'll be able to shout out your fundraiser. So somewhat I led that conversation to bring you here. And so when I do the YouTube videos, for example, I shouldn't really be a guy who's a leader naturally, but just by picking up this book, realizing what you said is to, to be able to inspire others to talk in their interests. I've been able to convince a lot of guys to start meditating, to start journaling, to start being active in their self-improvement to better themselves. Just because I said, okay, here's my story. If you do the exact same actions as me, you'll get the exact same results. And then I have like videos of girls and you know, the stuff that these guys all want talk in their interests. Oh, definitely. But I think there's, there's one key fact in all of that, which is you care. 
And that is so important. That's true. Such an important factor of leadership. You care. Will it be caring about the goal you're trying to achieve or care about others? And that fits and aligns with you. And you can see, like I said at the start, you you just from seeing the stuff you you talk when you talk about people you've helped already, you care, which is gonna make you a good leader. And and you can because of that, you care because you're reading those books. You know, I've read that book mm. and I know you'll be reading probably books that I've read before as well. And that's all because you care and want to learn and get better. That's true. What advice would you give to any young man who's watching this who wants to make something of himself? I suppose what would you class as make something of themselves? Do you think that's in a, when they feel successful about themselves or when they're, when they're happy? That's it. Yeah. I think, so I don't think there's one straight answer to that because everyone marks happiness differently. So like my probably, you know, and we, I think we all go through different stages in life where happiness and success is different things. So I probably, I think if I was going to give a piece of advice, I would always say that you probably know best. That person inside will know what makes them happy and when they feel successful. Because I could feel like, as an example, you know, I don't sit, I, I'm not, I don't drive a fancy car, haven't got loads of money stashed away or anything like that. I couldn't go on loads of fancy holidays, but that's not my marker of success, whereas others will be. So I think it's very important for you to know yourself and spend time to find yourself uh, before you can start setting down the goals in order to see, am I going to be successful? So I know I probably haven't answered the question there, but I, it's a difficult one. I think I could tell you what, for me personally, but I don't think that would apply for everyone that listens. That's, no, that's very well said. So let's say, let's imagine a guy who isn't so materialistic. He's a little bit similar to us where, of course, money's nice, but it's not exactly what he's chasing. He's more chasing that fulfillment to help other people. What would you say to, what would you say to younger Jack? Okay. Yeah. So I'd say, yeah, that's cool. So I'd say find, find what you love doing. So find an angle into what, into making a difference and caring about others. So you, for instance, you, you know, you've done yours through, through what I probably class as mental health and that, that support. I probably did mine through fitness because that was my interest. And I think the second point to it and the final one would be then your limitation so what has stopped you trying that already? There'll be something. So for instance, mine, when I was younger, especially my time early on in the military, my limitation was being scared of failure. So I was fear, I was fair, like feared, scare, uh, sort of like, yeah, I feared messing up and looking silly in front of others. So I, in, in, if you probably summarize that, I was worried about what other people thought too much. Mm. And uh, so I always say, find what that limitation is that's already stopped you from taking that step. And you're going to have to learn to try and control that, which is a difficult thing to do. How did you do it? Um, I think it's an ongoing process. I'm probably still doing it now, to be honest with you. What, eight years later? I think I just realized very quickly that my fear of what others thought was stopping me putting my hand up for further opportunities of growth. So... Um, I had to, there's a, there's a difference, isn't there? I think the, op and I said this again last night in this talk was, there's a difference between doing and thinking, they're opposites. So there's a, there's a point where you can think and you'll plan and you'll know, and there's a point where you've got to do as well. And if you only do one, you'll never do the other. Mm. So you've got to make sure that you understand. So for me, it was very much like, well, look, I was thought about it. I was like, I know what's stopping me doing this. I'm scared of failing, right? So then I was like, well, I need to do something about that. So I was starting to do fitness. And my first stage was I'm going to enter a fitness competition. And I entered one which no one would know I was going to do really. And I just turned up and did it. And then I, I, you know, I didn't win. And I was like, okay, cool. I didn't win. Didn't feel that bad. I enjoyed the process. And I actually had an opportunity to try and win. So I was like, great. So that then just evolved of me then adding those layers on. But I think it's, you know, this it, everyone's limitation. I think you'll be, I, I always think you're probably, in, you're consciously working on it consistently. I'm still working on the whole idea of caring about what others think. Um, so I, I do think it's probably an ongoing process, but by actually willing to take a step and try outside that zone, mm. I have grown my bubble a little bit bigger. So now for instance, I've got to the point where I can put my hands up online and go, yeah, I'm doing this 24 hour chin up challenge. I'm going to get news outlets and things to watch it. And then, you know, there's probably a, at the minute, maybe like a 60, 70% chance of me failing the event, but I'm willing to put my hand up and try it because it gives me the opportunity to do it. 
So something you just said that there's, it's that split of the opposites of thinking about it and doing it, thinking about it and taking action. Mm. What would you say is some advice for someone who struggles to do the second part of taking action? I'd probably say break it up. So often, you know, let's say for instance, we're looking at opening a gym together. Yeah. The thought of planning all that and actually taking a step and going to, you know, either purchase a unit or rent a unit and then open a gym. That feels like a very, very big step just to go and do. So break it up. So what I would say is, okay, well, let's, let's go and learn about how we run this business and do the accounts. Then I go, all right, well, should we start coaching some people for free in the, in the park? one-on-one, you know, and just learn that process. Whilst we're doing that, Hamza, I want you to go and look at units and you're going to see, you know, how much units cost and what, how we negotiate deals. So break it all up and take, because it will allow you to take small steps rather than just thinking, I'm going to open a gym, I'm going to go and do it now. Because it, because it, that's where the, it feels like the, it's so far away, you won't feel like you can do it. So by breaking up, you know, you can apply that to everything. We could talk fitness, lifestyle changes, all those things, yeah. Mm, fantastic advice <clears throat> sometimes I have to put on the same mentality to myself if I've just woken up you know feeling beaten up from yesterday's workout having the mindset that I've got to go and smash another one and a half hour workout is difficult but the mindset then is the current problem is literally just getting out from underneath the covers and then it's going to the toilet and then it's putting on the gym clothes and then it's going outside the house and then it's going to the gym it's only focusing on the next problem indeed yeah exactly that That's so true breaking it down. It's a very nice way to put it because I, I think that applies to someone in any level right now. And the more that you actually follow a principle like this, the more that you just focus on yourself and try and up, up level yourself, the, the less, or we can say the more space you can have in between those breaks and you can actually have like bigger blocks. So if you've been training for a while, eventually it's not just, you know, wake up, put your gym clothes on. It's just, oh yeah, you can crunch it down to just, yeah, I'm just going to go hit legs one and a half hours. Whereas that used to be a huge feat when we first started. That used to be insane. And it just shows you the amount of progress that you can make with just a simple mindset like that, just breaking it down. It's so true because the more, the more experience you build in those situations, the more normal it becomes. Mm. So it's very much like these challenges I've done, you know, for someone on the outside, that feels like it's a crazy big step. But for me, it's a very small step because I've been there so many times and had those experiences. Um, so, you know, it, uh, it's, a, it's a bit like what I say to a few people that do say that. I say, like, the, 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 more, the, the more you do probably abnormal things, the more normal they become is probably the best way of thinking about it. And that's the same applies to all the stuff you just said there, yeah. Mm. <laughs> so it's not the do 6,000 chin-ups, it's just do the next one. Yeah, exactly that, yeah. It's a lot less so, daunting. The cool principle of breaking up, I've applied to this training because my first chin-up session, I've got a little bar outside here in the, in the back garden. I said, ah, oh, one evening I sort of started to think about what I wanted to do. And I, you know, uh, my business mentor, I was chatting to him about what we're going to do, the charity stuff. And I was like, right, I fancy doing something like this because I probably will fail it. And they were like, that is crazy. You know, you, why, why do you do something you know you're good at that we can get, the, get a world record for another one? And I'd be like, great. Um, and I was like, well, it doesn't, you know, that doesn't interest me. This does. So I went outside that first evening and I tried to do a hundred, obviously not in one go, just in like a few reps at a time. And it took me a while, but I got a hundred done. And I was like, okay, that's a starting point. I know, you know, I didn't think in my head, well, I've only done a hundred. I've got 6,000 to do in 24 hours. I'm behind the time frame. All I said was, okay, great. I'm going to try and get those, do those hundred a little quicker over the next two weeks. Once I did that, I was like, I'm going to try and see if I can do 250. And I did when I did 250. And then I jumped to 500. And now, you know, that took me about a month and a half to get to the point of doing 500 in a set session. Whereas, for instance, yesterday, I was on a bad day of training, didn't feel good. I did 500 in the morning and then 500 in the evening. And I'm doing them not feeling good. So it shows the transition as you start to bit, take, break it up and take those steps towards that end goal. So, yeah, I think that's, that's so important. Your lats massive now. Oh, no. I've been trying to be careful. I've been trying to get big arms for years, mate. It never happens. <laughs> my genetics, mate. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to blame my, blame my parents for that. <laughs> blame it on the genetics. <laughs> that actually brings us to the next point that I wanted to talk about is the limiting beliefs. 
because even though we we're slightly joking about this, a lot of people actually will flat out say, no, I've got bad genetics, so I won't even try. Uh, okay. Yes. So, so I'd say that's one of the limita- like limitations we've talked about earlier. Um, you know, like you, you can go right into the deep scientific side of things in terms of going, I, I don't know, if you look at some of my fitness competitions, naturally you're going to be better being a shorter athlete. Um, mm. A bit like playing basketball, you're going to be better being a taller athlete. But I think you can't, you can't let that control if you're going to try and achieve something. So that's really, really important. So that's applied to this next challenge I'm taking on uh, where where, you know, I, I have, I am a hundred kilos an example, and I've got really long arms. So each rep is going to be harder than someone that's 30 kilos lighter in his short arms, but I'm going to remove that benefit that they have through hard work. Mm. So I think, uh, I think when it become you know, when they, it's, and if we looked at job wise, you know, we, I, I'm terrible, for instance, I'm not very good at sitting down and doing administration on the computer as an example. Yeah. But if that was my goal, I'd start to build on. In my head, I'd be like, well, I'm terrible at it. But I'd start to learn. I'd read a book. I'd learn about how to use IT a bit better and take those steps to get there. It's hard to tell someone, don't just allow that be your limitation. But I suppose if you're listening and you've got that kind of limitation in your head, all you need to know is you're just stopping yourself from having an opportunity. Well said. How would you say, what is the practical way to go about reducing the limiting beliefs that we have? Mm. Um, that's a really difficult question because I think there's quite a few different avenues to look down there so I think the first stage is to maybe like we said earlier to break up whatever you're trying to achieve so let's say for instance we're looking at each, the, look, let's say for instance you want to do a muscle up on the rings right you know you're doing lots of ring work at the minute I saw so you want to do a muscle up on the rings that muscle up will feel like, oh, it's really far away to get right now. So you probably just think, well, you know, I'm not good enough. I won't do it. So then what you could do is go, well, I, I, you know, I would really love to achieve a muscle up, but let's see if I can do five pull-ups on the rings first. Mm-hmm. And then, and I actually had this discussion with someone on LinkedIn because I put up a post, I think last week, and this is one of my principles. So it's like one in 10. And this is exactly how I did that ski erg record was, I, I jumped on there and I did an hour on it and I was ha- able to hold a 24 hour record pace for an hour. So I was like, okay, I can do that for an hour. I reckon if I train, I can do that for two hours. Mm. And then I reckon I could probably do that for four. So, um, and they said, well, what if you can't do one hour? And I said, and um, we were talking in reference to the chin up. So I said, you know, I did 10, which meant I could do a hundred. And they said, well, I can't even do one. And my reply was, but you can hang on the bar, can't you? And they can. So, so it's, the, it's, the, it's the exact same principle. So I think that, that, that taking the steps, but really going small to begin with, and maybe mm. hit little goals off that, that are going to take you a little bit closer, maybe climbing that mountain up towards that ultimate. Um, to, to remove your limitation, though, you've got to spend a lot of time like, looking at yourself, understanding and then also looking outwards and understanding that because in the world of social now, like everyone's opinions of each other is, is, is mixed and it's weird. It's not under quite the same kind of control anymore. Like it used to be, it's not on face value anymore. So often people do worry and they compare and they think they're not good enough and they do worry about what other people think. <clears throat> so you have to spend time understanding yourself and then realizing that anything outside that realm actually doesn't really matter Mm. so we can say that the limiting belief is more that they feel unable to do that huge task and that's just because they they haven't just yet adopted that mentality of just breaking it down yes and that's and that you know obviously you say huge task and that's perspective so a huge task could be getting out of bed in the morning um, so, so, and that sounds bizarre to say, but it's true. You know, I've spoken and I've spoken to friends before that have had those problems. I've had those problems in the past before where my ultimate challenge is something mega, it, it, like in perspective of what else I've done is mega small. But at that time, that was a huge challenge to try and do. So I think, yeah, you're right. Breaking it down and, and 
taking those steps and uh, and yeah and then just I think like you said there finding who you are and really understanding who you are is very very important but I think that's again an ongoing process as well mm. so what you said then that sometimes the biggest problem one of us can face is just getting out of bed I think on one of your Instagram posts you've mentioned mental mental health how is that going yeah good mate yeah I think you know I it's been, it's been really, really tough this last year. I think um, uh, it's a, it, for me, it's been a mix of lots of things put together combined that has made that stress very, very high. And for me, I'm slowly working on making those changes to eradicate that stress and understand it a little bit better. Um, so if, you know, if, we, if we talk deeply about it, I had lots going on in, in my life in the sense of I'd spent the last five years building this business that we were talking about earlier. And I, and I really hadn't paid myself a penny. So you know, from the outside, you'd be looking in Hamza going, wow, Jack's got four gyms and he's built a franchise. But I didn't have any money to buy a house. I literally just about had my old car that was just working. Um, and I had still had the same clothes that I was wearing four or five years ago. And that's because the way I'm, way I'm programmed, I couldn't take money from the business myself if I, if I felt like I wasn't paying the staff in, in enough or I felt like the business could still be progressing and offering more to our members. Um, so that slowly chipped away because of the stress of that and uh, of trying to grow the business and also then going, well, you know, I haven't got my own life in order yet, financially maybe. Then also that I was slowly losing the love of what I was doing, which was, which as the business grew, I loved the groundwork. I loved building things up. I loved taking on that challenge, right? And all of a sudden the business have grew to this point where it was a bit of a ticking beast now, you know, it was going to be move churning through now. Um, and there was a lot of administrational work things to do now, which my day to day job, which I didn't enjoy. So that was probably a factor to it. Um, so, you know, there was all those little bits and I was trying to probably at the same time, probably find a little bit more out about myself because I've never really taken a step back before because I've always been go, 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 uh, and not gone, you know, who am I? Who's, who's Jack Fletney? And I think we all go through those processes and try and find out a little bit more about ourselves. And why, why do we think differently to other people or do things differently? So those combined factors started to slowly chip. And I think eventually it, it led to like little spouts of just little bits of anxiety and stress, uh, which just basically made me unhappy. So, and you know, I'm, I'm slowly controlling it now. I still sometimes don't have, I have days where, you know, I, I, things don't quite go the way I want and I have to learn to try and control that a bit better now. Uh, so, so yeah, for me, my journey, again, it's a, it's a process and it is, it's getting better and better, but I suppose, the, the reason I put that post up was because so many people are speaking to that were currently having their own problems and their challenges. And I just wanted people to realize that because people come to me and chat to me quite a lot because they'll think, you know, I've, I look at the things I do, I've got it, everything. Um, and I wanted them to realize that it's not all like sunshine and rainbows from what you maybe mm -hmm. see on the front. And I think that's the same for everyone. We all have our own problems and challenges. So yeah, so I put that post out and just to basically say, look, you know, yeah, I might be trying to take on these crazy things and doing all this and that, but actually there's, there is other things that are part of that and other challenges that I face personally. So you're not on your own basically. And, and it, and it got what I wanted because then straight away I had a number of different people message and say, look, I've, I could have a chat and I just had jumped onto, you know, a, a video call or whatever, some people and had a chat with them. So I think, um, yeah, it was, it, that was probably the, the reason why I wanted to put it out there. That's very powerful. And I don't agree as well, because on social as well, like, you know, on social media, there's so mm -hmm. many people out there that you just, uh, I could understand that through seeing their success, it would just be slowly digging at you as an individual. So then I just wanted to put that stuff out because I had a lot of people that were sort of like following and really cheering me on, as it were, online, which was lovely. You know, I haven't got, I've only got a very small amount of followers, but it was still the amount of people who were engaged in what I was doing was great. So I wanted them to realize that actually, you know, we all, we all have these challenges. It's not, it's not just them. That's very nice of you. I think that's, that's almost like a growing trend now is we're all remembering that we're all human and the, we're, we only really upload the highlights. You know, when your abs are flexed and you're fasted and you're popping and the bicep veins sticking out, you're not going to upload the picture of you when you sat down and the, the rolls are just roll upon roll. 
And the issue is that when you see someone else's highlights, you often aren't at your point of the highlight. So you'll see someone, you know, the, the fitness model's physique when you've just finished eating your cheat meal of the day and you're not feeling so great. And in terms of the challenges and the discipline, some people might be following you on their phone whilst they're lying in bed, struggling to get out of bed. And then they're seeing this, this guy, this weird guy is doing 6,000 chin-ups and these people are like, wait, that's not even normal. That's not even possible. And so it, it is such a respectful thing that you've done to actually say, no, me too. I have those days too. And if people have been messaging you, you've been replying and you've been able, like, able to speak to some people about that, then you've got my respect because that's exactly what I like to do. No, damn right. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's that comparison, isn't it, mate? Comparison is a thief of joy. Um, it's so it's, it's mate it's so hard isn't it it's so hard dealing with what you see on social media and then just thinking ah damn it I'm not good enough mm. and one of my goals with social in the near future as I start to get a bit better at using it and maybe put more out there is I'm going to try and be as transparent as possible mm. with what's happening on my journey and not just go yeah look at me I did 500 chimps today I wanted to be very much like today's training was terrible I did not want to do it like it was yesterday. Literally, I did not want to do it. Um, and I wasn't feeling good. I was like sore to touch before I even started. Um, but I went and thought, well, I'll just do the first few sets of pull-ups. And I started on them and then just said, well, I'm just going to slowly chip through. I didn't worry about how fast I did it. I didn't worry about how good they were, anything like that. I just chipped away and got them done. Rather than going, if you, if you compared that to what I could have done, I could have put out yesterday, yeah, not through thousand reps yeah easy peasy see you all tomorrow you know when it wasn't like that mate i was there last night thinking what the bloody hell am i doing <laughs> <laughs> a big thing that we have in self-improvement is coming over those almost like the weak feelings we get and something that i try and teach the boys on my youtube is that a lot of the times you don't actually have to listen to your feelings it seems like you did that yesterday yes uh, I do. And actually, sometimes what I do them, they're the best days. Some, there's, a, there's, a, there's two sides to it. So as an example, like today, uh, I feel just knackered, right? So my body feels tired. So I know that if I, if I try and go out and do lots today, I'm not going to get very much from it. It might be a tad pointless. But probably after this conversation, I might just go for a little walk or something before it gets too dark and get a bit of fresh air, right? Because I've been sat here all day on the computer. Uh, whereas yesterday... I was like, well, I've scheduled this in. I know I've got to get it done. I've got to get it done sometime this week. And I knew I was just a bit sore. And I was, you know, those days where you probably, you a bit like your, your, so a bit like your physical strength, your mental strength goes through different ranges. Sometimes you have days where you're on fire. Sometimes you have days where you're not. So I was on one of those days yesterday, I weren't on fire. But they're sometimes the most rewarding days when you do actually get something done because you finish it and you're like, you know what? Yeah, I was slow as hell getting that done. But I weren't feeling it. And I'm, I, was, and I was actually pleased that I did it. So for me, my reference was, well, yesterday, I felt terrible. It took me ages, but I got a 1,000 chin-ups done. And I was like, that's a win for me. That's a huge win. Uh, and, then, you know, and, then, and then just come home and reset. And then, well, woke up this morning feeling extreme, even more sore. But yeah. <laughs> Back to another 1,000. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you say, let's say there's a... 21 year old guy right now and he's got kind of similar goals to where we originally started with he wants to get fit and healthy but he just struggles with motivation a lot he gets into it you know he watches the body transformation video the Arnold Schwarzenegger video and he's really really hyped and then after that it just dips what would you say to him two things set an actual goal down you want to try and achieve and make it accountable and then remove anything around that goal that's going to affect it. So your, your goal could be, for instance, so this, this lad's goal could be that, I, I think it needs to be a tangible goal. So it can't be something like, I want to look good. Because if he says that, when, when are you ever going to think you look good? If, mm. you, if you're in that kind of mindset. I think it needs to be like, you know, a bit like yours, where, you know, you're trying to do you, you, some of your gymnastic movements um, and you're, you're trying to lift certain weights. I think it's important to set those metrics. And then around that challenge, have someone to make you accountable for it. And then over time, as you get better, you can start to make yourself accountable through yourself. So that's, that's for instance, so with the, with the training for these challenges, I can do that. I'm all over that. I'll make myself accountable um, because if I miss things I've scheduled in, it makes me feel bad. 
Mm. And whereas, for instance, I'm doing lots of running at the minute as well, but I've got someone who programs that for me to make me accountable because with running, I could easily miss that because I'm not that bothered about it, you know what I mean? So well, that's my difference of accountability. But then the removing aspects of things is going to affect that. So if, if your man is on, for instance, on Instagram and he follows all these bodybuilding guys and they're making him feel like crap and he's not good enough, then remove that aspect. So unfollow them, remove them. Don't go on Instagram if it's going to affect you. Um, and remove people maybe that are going to naysay unless you know how to control that. So, you know, we've all, you've probably had naysayers before. I've had them before. When, when I said I was going to join the Marines, when I said I was going to try and play, be a rugby player, when I said I was going to leave the Marines and try and set up a business, my parents were like, what are you doing? No way. What, you know, you've been successful in there. Carry on. You won't be able to run a business, like blah, 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 blah. Do you, you know, I think there's those aspects that, so probably set the, set an actual proper goal down you want to achieve, find someone's going to make you accountable and then remove all the different aspects around that, that maybe will, will hinder you, you know, working towards it. Mm. How would you say that this guy eventually could make himself accountable? I think that's done over time because I think that's something you build through experience. So I don't think, um, I don't know, I think to begin with, if you're in that low point in terms of just starting this journey, that's why, you know, your mentors and life coaches work because they're an opportunity to keep you accountable. And that's, that's why they're so essential, I think. That's what fitness coaches do, you know, because me and you, if we could just download a training program off Google like that, but the coaches keep you accountable. That's what, they're, that's what you pay them for realistically. Um, especially in fitness anyway. So that's what I found. So, yeah. Um, but I think over time then, as you get better and you have a real reason why you can start to keep yourself accountable. So my reason why is I want to fundraise and make people proud of what we're trying to do. So then when I, when I go out and I think, you know, I don't fancy doing these chin-ups right now, I'm thinking, well, you know, number one, I'm thinking if I don't do these set. Um, that's one session I've missed in the lead up towards trying this 24 hour world record. Uh, maybe when I was younger, there's a competitive aspect to me. So when I was playing rugby, I'd, every day I had a nickname Kino because I'd train, do training and then I'd be training on my own for hours till it got dark. Um, and all I would be thinking there was I'm outworking the person that's trying to take the shirt from me, if that makes sense. But, uh, and I think that was my own individual accountability that I built up. But the reason why maybe that might be the answer, you need to have a really good why. And if that why is strong, then I think you can start to make yourself accountable. Mm. So that, that really good and big reason why we can say is someone's purpose. And I think I remember reading that your purpose was to chase hardship to help other people. Mm. Is that right? I say that's literally bang on, mate. Yeah, I want to uh, take on, I want to take on different challenges that are going to test me physically and mentally, all built around helping um, helping children that maybe haven't had the same opportunity that I've had. That's that that's the that's the easiest way of breaking it down. That's beautiful. Uh, for, so for me, raising money for these charities, the one thing I feel emotional about. So I'm not the, I'm not the, probably the most emotional person, but the most, most emotion I probably feel in connection is when I see kids that haven't got a good opportunity, whether that be health, lifestyle, demographics, I don't think it's fair. So, uh, because when I see adults, I think adults do have an opportunity to make change in whatever avenue where kids, they don't, they're given that to begin with. And um, whether it be a health problem or a, or a lifestyle problem or where they've grown up. So, yeah. So I think that's, that's for me, that's what I feel an emotional connection to. So one last major question. Imagine the same 21 year old guy we were talking about before. Any advice for him to try and find his purpose? Yes. I think you've got to, you've, you've got to go and try lots of different things. Yeah. You can't just think, oh, that's it. You know, I've seen this online. I think that sounds good. You've got to go out and be willing to try lots because eventually you'll, something will click with you. And you've got to be willing to change as well because you might try something and you just know that I'm not feeling that. And I've done that a number of times. Um, so, you know, I did it with the military. I've even done it with running the business, really. You know, so 
before you can find something that makes you tick. And I think also those purposes change. Your, your purposes have probably changed if you look back and, and I'm sure they'll change in the future as well. But right now you've found the one, that purpose that you feel fueled by and it makes you happy and it makes you driven. Uh, so be willing to change. And I think let, let, let uh, your interest direct you, let that passion slowly burn and direct mm. you in the right direction. Yeah. Mm. Completely agreed. And that's, it's such almost cliche advice. Like, oh yeah, just go and try new things. But it's only after you've actively spent some time trying new things that you actually realize the value of that piece of advice. And that's why I think pretty much everyone's purpose changes every few years is you end up just trying something new. You speak to someone new and eventually something just hits you like, oh wait, this is actually the most important thing now. Exactly. And so, so for instance, that 21 year old could, could like, without realizing it, have a love of sport, but they've never played sport before. So they're never going to realize, you know, um, and, and so they're going to have to go down that sports club and try to play football or rugby or badminton, whatever it's going to be, but they need to go and try it. Um, because if they don't and they just, you know, they, they do their nine to five, what they're doing and tick over, then they won't find it. So yeah, I think you've got, I think there's an element of risk there as well. You've got to be willing to probably take a risk. What you see as a risk, whether it be a career change or a, or uh, taking the risk to walk down to your local rugby club, which could be daunting to go, yeah, I want to try and play rugby today. Uh, so, yeah. Well said. This was a fantastic chat, Jack. Thank you. Absolute pleasure, mate. No, I appreciate you uh, asking me to jump on, mate. Mm. Okay, boys, you've been watching this far. You obviously think this guy is remarkable and inspiring and motivating. And his videos on his channel are actually... Bro, just go and watch them. Go to the description right now. I've linked all of his content. Just click it. You've already liked this guy, so just go and subscribe and then go and watch whatever he's posting out. I got you back. <laughs> Very grateful for you to join me today, mate. Pleasure, mate. No, thanks, mate. And hopefully we will uh, see each other again uh, climb up a side of a mountain. I want to try that next time. <laughs> there you go. Take care of yourself, bro. Cheers, mate. Bye-bye.